What's up, guys? This is Derek Kirby. It is Victory Tuesday for the Dallas Cowboys. And if last week's performance at the LA Chargers did not make you a believer in this Dallas Cowboys team, perhaps Monday night did. In the Cowboys' home opener, Dak Prescott's first game at home at AT&T Stadium in 351 days, Dallas laid the wood to the Philadelphia Eagles, 41-21. This game was a 20-point victory, obviously, but I don't even think it was that close, frankly. First of all, the Cowboys had a touchdown straight up robbed from them. Dak Prescott rushed for a touchdown, extended over the pylon. How it wasn't called on the field a touchdown when it happened is baffling in itself. But then upon official review, to be upheld as not a touchdown... When the ball's a full yard extended over the goal line, absolutely baffling. Thankfully, it had no bearing in the game. Dallas, from start to finish, laid the wood. Now, in this game, the offense starts red hot early. Dak Prescott, surgical, moving down the field. He goes, and I think he completes 11 of his first 12 passes for 133 yards and a touchdown. The one blip... That does happen in there, which, by the way, the the incompletion was actually a pinpoint pass to Dalton Schultz, I believe it was, over the middle that would have set up Dallas in the red zone on the opening drive. A great play made by the Eagles' safety, blows it up, knocks the ball from uh, Schultz's hands, and so that's the one incompletion. Dak did what he was supposed to. The receiver just did not haul it in completely. The one blemish early on for Dallas was they go down and they get that touchdown. You get like a 44-yard or a 49-yard strike to C.D. Lamb to like the half-yard line. You get a touchdown then with Zeke running across the goal line. Then on defense, you have an initial, the first play of the game, a little bit of a, a gasp moment where you're like, oh, don't be indicative of the rest of this game. Jalen Hurts connects on a short pass to Dallas Goder. This is the one key I would say fault or bad play from Trayvon Diggs, who was sensational in this game. We'll get into him in in a minute. But it goes for 38 yards on the first play for the Eagles. And you're like, ooh, okay. We know the Dallas front seven is very thin right now. They're without Demarcus Lawrence for a good while. Uh, they've got guys out as well on the back end. Keanu Neal, who's been great for Dallas, out. And we have real questions about what they're going to look like. Can they get pressure? Obviously, last week they had to move Micah Parsons to defensive end from linebacker just to get pressure. And they kind of had a quandary this this week. Like, how did they use him? Because without Keanu Neal, there's less protection on the back end. They kind of need him out there. But at the same time, they're still thin, even with Randy Gregory coming back to help one side of that pass rush. They kind of need him there. So they kind of used him as a hybrid here today. And he is an absolute ultimate game wrecker Great game from him as well. Again, we'll get into that more. But the first play goes 38 yards for the Eagles to go there. It's the one big play I felt like Diggs kind of gave up. Not gave up as in like didn't try. Gave up as in like yielded. And then the next play, Hurts makes a bad throw. Tries to get it all back. Knows that, hey, they just, you know, all the momentum for them. They just marched down the field, including that deep strike to C.D. Lamb, another Hurts teammate, uh, former teammate rather. And so he tried to kind of do the same thing and ta uh, targeted Jalen Rager. And he just underthrows it. If he throws it five yards out ahead of him into the end zone, Anthony Brown's beat. But he underthrows it, and Anthony Brown gets one of the easiest interceptions of his career. Intercepts it down at basically the half-yard line. And so Dallas, despite a march down the field and a, and a dominant touchdown and then an immediate interception, they're backed up against the goal line, and it goes bad quickly Dak Prescott does a drop back he holds on to it you could say maybe a little too long but the problem is uh Badash just gets completely did I say Badash that's hilarious uh gets completely completely blown up in the middle and it just immediately Fletcher gets there to Dak hits his arm ball knocked up in the air it's ruled a fumble not an interception but he catches it out of the air, and he's in the end zone, so it's a touchdown. The Eagles' defense, in the blink of an eye, responds with a huge touchdown to tie the game at seven. 
that was kind of like a, ooh, okay, that could take momentum away. Like, you looked like you were about to explode out of the gates and really take control of the game, and now the Eagles' defense just gave them a touchdown. I thought that the Cowboys' defense was going to ultimately prove the difference in this game, and I think they did, but I thought they were going to be the the one of the two defenses that made the plays, just enough of them, to prove the difference, and did not come down to that. Thankfully, after that, Dallas is able to respond with another quality drive. That's where you then get down to the end zone where Dak has the absurd, overruled, or rather incorrectly ruled touchdown taken back. The Eagles on fourth and goal from like the one-yard line get credited with a stop. They never blew the play dead, not until Dak extends it out, holds it there for a moment, and then the ball's knocked out by the Eagles defender. And it wasn't until the ball bounced back and the Eagles went to go recover it that they finally blew their whistle. So the play wasn't blown dead. He ducks his head down. That's the only thing I can think is that they treated it as if it was blown dead, even though they never actually blew it dead. Because he, he reaches down and you can't see where it is. And then he kind of stands back up and extends it out. And so uh, maybe their confusion is where the play was actually blown dead or rather they thought it was blown dead earlier than it was. I don't know. Regardless, the Eagles take over at the one-yard line, and they don't get anything. Hertz is immediately under duress. They go a quick three and out instantly. Dallas gets the ball back around midfield, marches down, and gets into the end zone. No questions here. Zeke bursts through and gets a definitive touchdown. So Dallas goes up 14-7 there. In that first quarter, which, by the way, that that touchdown... Um, that no, I was going to say I thought that was the start of the second quarter, but I think it was still the first. Dallas had 13 first downs in the first quarter alone. They did that last week against the Chargers, too. That is dominant. If you recall this team last year, the year before that even, they were notorious for slow starts, and they would fall behind big, and then they'd have to drag themselves back in, rally, and that's why people would accuse Dak of his stats being empty because they said, oh, well, it's garbage stats. How is it garbage time stats in the first and second quarter? Well, he's only doing it when he's up big. He's slow start, and that's why they're in the hole, and he has to pull them out. Okay, well, here you go. They're starting fast now. Dallas, 13 first downs in the first quarter last week, 13 first downs in the first quarter this week. Why is that 13 number so in impressive? The Eagles had 12 first downs for the game. Going into the fourth quarter, they had four first downs. They barely touched the ball. The Eagles had something like 38 or 40 snaps in the game. The NFL average is 64. They couldn't do anything. And it's not just the fact that Jalen Hurts, he made a couple nice throws. He did. But it wasn't just the mistakes. It wasn't just the two interceptions. Should have been three. Should have had a pick six uh, when the Eagles went three and out at their own goal line. Uh, Anthony Brown on a deflection should have had an easy, sorry, not Anthony Brown, Jordan Lewis should have had the easiest pick six of his life, but didn't quite react to it in time. Ball hits the ground. That's a shame, but even still, Dallas is able to take control. So they're up 14-7, should be 21-7 in the first quarter. Like they are running away with this. The Eagles can't get anything going. It's not just Hurts throwing a couple picks. It's not just the fact that for some reason, the Eagles just were not running the ball. The Eagles had, Hertz had nine carries for 35 yards. Sanders had two for 27. Two for 27 for their starting running back. Gainwell got one in garbage time, one for two, two yards. They didn't run the ball. 13 total carries. A lot of those Hertz ones weren't even really designed. So, yeah. The play balance was terrible for the Eagles, and the fact that they fell behind so quickly, so sizably, really dictated that. Dallas was able to seize control early, and they got sloppy at times. They absolutely did, but they never relinquished it. Dallas put their foot on the Eagles' throat, and they pressed down until the Eagles stopped twitching. Like that's, It's morbid. <laughs> But it is what they did. The defense, despite being shorthanded, did not play shorthanded. They played like they were at full strength and they wanted to make a statement. And what I liked is that you saw huge games from multiple defenders. Uh, KZ flying around, really leading the defense vocally, pumping up the crowd. 
Curse had big plays as well for the defense. Very good play out of him. In fact, he had five tackles, a team leading five tackles, three of which were solo and a pass defended. Uh, you had inconsistent play, I'll say, from Jalen Smith. At times, he played quite well. Not perfect, but well. But then the Eagles did later on have their first offensive touchdown drive of the game came in the third quarter, and it basically came exclusively on the back of attacking Jalen Smith again and again and again. And for some reason, Jalen Smith, even on a scramble where he gives up nine yards to Jalen Hurts, is celebrating and like high-fiving the cheerleaders as if he just made some big play. He didn't. I, I don't know what that was about. It, it's an odd Jalen Smith phenomenon. But Dallas is just fully in control here. The, the defense is nails. They're getting pressure up front. Uh, you get 37 uh, rush attempts out of Micah Parsons. He's all over the field here. Four tackles, three of which were solo. You also have a, a crazy pass defended by him where he makes a great play basically at the line, just diving like a jump man pose, swatting the ball, fingertip that leads to an incompletion. He had a tackle for loss, a sack, or a half sack rather, just a great game, constantly flying around that edge and putting pressure on him. You basically have a guy who's your outside linebacker drawing double teams in week three of his career. And at other times, the Eagles were chipping him with Sanders trying to buy Hurts just that extra moment more to maybe make something happen. That is unbelievable. But it wasn't just him. You had Randy Gregory, who I know his stats don't show up here in the same way, but he made a lot of big plays as well for them. Randy Gregory, let me see. Randy Gregory, I'm trying to look up his stats here. Man, his stats, his performance was so much better than what the stat sheet would tell you. He was exploding off the line all night, putting immense pressure on Jalen Hurts and really making containment strong for Dallas. And then in the middle, you had Osa wrecking shop, blowing it up. Osa, huge game, four tackles, two of which were solo, one tackle for loss, a sack and a half, nearly another full sack uh, on what leads to the Eagles one or first rather scoring drive for the offense of the day again we'll get to that but Dallas here led 21-7 at the half one thing we should talk about is Mike McCarthy still not knowing how to work a clock I understand not taking the timeout when it was fourth and five and the Eagles say oh, hey maybe they go for it so do I want to call a timeout I don't want to give up points but the problem is they the Eagles had like a minute 30 left and they were facing or a minute I think 10 and they were facing third and 24. He should have taken a timeout then. The broadcasters called it. If you watch the Manning cast, they were calling it. Like, take the timeout. What are you doing? The official even goes over to McCarthy on the sideline and asks, you want to use your timeout? And he goes, no, nah, I'm good. I, I don't understand it. He blamed last week's, you know, they got bailed out by Zerline making the 56-yarder last week. Not so much here. It's, he can't blame the clock for what happened, not some arbitrary malfunction for what happened. They just didn't execute. He didn't take control and manage the game like he needed to. Ends up 21-7 at half, and Dallas is able to carry that momentum on. The offense does start sluggish in the third quarter, two, three and outs, essentially. And it was the defense really showing out at that point. Yeah, you get the Trayvon Diggs, as you see the thumbnail here to my side. Trayvon Diggs making a big, big play uh, in which they're able to intercept, in which Diggs is able to intercept as former Alabama quarterback. Granted, he left OU, was his last team in college. Former Alabama quarterback Jalen Hurts targeting Alabama star receiver and Heisman winner Devonta Smith. Intercepted by former Alabama star cornerback Trayvon Diggs for a pick six. Diggs balled out they went after Trayvon Diggs a lot in this game targeted six times he does give up three completions but other than the Godair one all incredibly minimal he has let me see what his final stat line was here I had a note of it somewhere it was something like oh wait here we go Trayvon Diggs ends up in the game 
two tackles, both of which were solo. The pick six INT, which was around the 35, 40-yard line. So a nice return there, completely unchallenged. Um, adds in three passes defended. Holy crap. Hertz kept going at him. He was trying to get Smith, their big X factor, and their star draft pick from this most recent class, trying to get him going. And Diggs was not having it. Unbelievable game from Diggs, man. I've, I've been talking about Trayvon Diggs for weeks now. And to me, there is no doubt Trayvon Diggs has arrived as a lockdown elite corner. Does that mean... He's Revis Island? No. But it's fair at this point to say he is a star cornerback. Somehow Pro Football Focus had him rated 75th best corner entering this year. He has six interceptions in his last eight games. Keep this in mind. In his career, which now spans 15 games, he has six interceptions. He didn't record an interception last year until week eight. He played 12 games last year. He has a pick in all three games this year. Six picks in eight games. This dude is a ball hawk and a playmaker. He is elite. And he was letting Jalen Hurts know, too. Hurts was challenging him, and he would slap it down. He bat it down before the receiver could get it. And then he's looking over there at Hurts, and he's talking. And I'm glad the official didn't throw. You know, we've seen how they've really cracked down this year on taunting. I'm glad he didn't say anything or that the official didn't uh, flag him for that. But he's letting Hurts know, man, like, you keep throwing at me, man. You're not going to like what happens. Hurts trying to get his X Factor going, kept trying it, and kept coming up dry. The well runneth bone dry. And yet they kept trying. Phenomenal game. I would say this is the arrival moment for Trayvon Diggs as an elite corner. And uh, I wrote about that for Blog and the Boys a while back as well. So by all means, check, uh, check that out. I've, I've posted that as well on Twitter. I'll put it in the description of this video as well. But you had Parsons and Gregory flying around the edge. You had Osa blowing up the middle of the line. The pressure from the Cowboys defense was phenomenal all night. They end up leading in time of possession, 34 minutes, 58 seconds, compared to just 25 minutes, 2 seconds for the Eagles. Total yardage is nearly even, but a lot of that is kind of garbage time. I mentioned the offense was a little sluggish to start the third quarter for the Cowboys. And the Eagles, they kind of climbed back in it. After you had the Diggs pick 6, you had Zerline miss the extra point. Again, remains concerning. Thankfully, it didn't matter in this game. Then you had the defense... Facing with the Eagles facing a third and eight at their own, I want to say, eight or nine yard line. Brought intense pressure. Osa narrowly misses another sack. Hurts just heaves one deep. Uh, heaves one deep for, I'm trying to remember who it was that he connected with. Gainwell. Uh, I believe, no, it was Watkins. Watkins that he connected with throwing deep. And it's like a 41 yard completion on third and eight. And the Cowboys, man, not only do you have Osa narrowly miss, you have like two other guys about to just destroy Jalen Hurts when he heaves that up. And it's completed against Kennedy, which is a, a little disappointing. Kennedy was also flagged on the play. He got flagged for two separate infractions of elite, of defensive holding and then pass interference and still gave up a 41-yard rece reception on third and eight. That's pretty insane to even consider. But a phenomenal, phenomenal stand from the defense on the day as a whole, this drive would go in the tank for them after that because that's when you would have the Eagles then attack Jalen Smith again and again and again and again. And that's when you started seeing Jalen Hurts utilizing his legs more, which is what he does best anyway. I don't know why not only did they not run the ball much in general, but they didn't even utilize him to his strengths. It's his seventh career start last night that he had, so I don't understand why they thought he would be able to pass with Dak Prescott, who was 21 of 26 for 238 yards and three touchdowns. Should have had a rushing touchdown as well that was taken from him. Just obscene that Philadelphia thought he could match Dak. But even still, uh, they go again and again and again at Jalen Smith. They move all the way down the field, and then they score a touchdown. Uh, defense totally fooled there, and he throws a touchdown pass to, I want to say it was... 
Ertz. Yeah, Zach Ertz uh, gets the touchdown there for Philadelphia. And they end up getting another one in garbage time, just a couple minutes left in the game. Um, you know, whatever. It, it is what it is. Dallas ran away with this, though. The running game, chewing up yardage. As Dallas marched down the field early on, it was on the legs, largely. Dak was great, but it was also on the legs of Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott. The balance of carries was great. 17 for Zeke, 95. That's 5.6 on average. Two touchdowns. He was running with great burst, great cuts, great vision. As good as Zeke, like, he's not the home run threat he used to be. Rookie year, Ezekiel Elliott, who could pop an 80-yard, a 75-yard, whatever touchdown run, is gone. But... He is still running with such physicality and burst. His longest carry on the night was 13 yards. And I think that's just indicative of what you're going to get from Zeke. But I think Dallas kind of understands that at this point because they gave Tony Pollard another healthy dose, 11 carries for him, 60 yards, 5.5 an average. Very, very good tandem running there by Dallas. And the result was 160 pass yards, for Dallas. Combine that with Dax 238, you've got 380 yards for the Cowboys. I mean, passing yards shows 220 for Dallas because of the four sacks Dak took, but even still, you get a very balanced performance from the Cowboys here. And I love how in week one, Dak slings it 58 times, and he shows, hey man, against that defensive front, running the ball is really not going to be an option. I have to be able to go out and light it up with my arm and he did didn't result in a win but that's not his fault he gave them he put them in position to win the game he got them the field goal they needed to take the lead and the problem was just that too much time was left and the defense uh, couldn't keep the Buccaneers from getting into chip shot field goal territory for the win the next two weeks much more balanced and Dak said before the season he wanted to be balanced he wanted an approach that would not see him throw throw for 6,000 yards because he wanted the offense to be more balanced, not just for his own sake, but because he feels that's what's best for the team to succeed. And it's translated. Their last two weeks have been wins, impressive wins against the Chargers, who are a very good football team, and against, by the way, the Chargers just beat the Chiefs. So that gives you some semblance of how good they are. And you beat them in their house. That's impressive. Then the Eagles, not on the same level as the Cowboys right now. The Cowboys are clearly the class for the moment, of the NFC East. And Dallas did what a good team is supposed to do. Really, what a dominant team is supposed to do. They trounced, trounced the inferior team. So very, very promising. And again, I like that the defense was just as good as the offense in this game. Dallas controls every aspect here. 27 first downs for them compared to 12 for Philadelphia. Only four penalties, three of which were holds on Connor Williams. The offensive line, while their run blocking was great, and the Eagles do have a good defensive line, for sure. For sure have a good defensive line. The Dallas offensive line remains a concern for me. It really does. Not just uh, not just the center getting blown up into Dak's lap. Not just the fact that um, Williams gets three holds. I really thought, while they could be bullies at times and enforce their will, and that was great to see, I still think there are concerns there this is not the dominant dominant offensive line of a few years ago you had a run from like 2014 until really 2016 where they were just the class of the NFL and since then they've been good largely last year so many injuries you really can't say that that was the exception they've still been good for the most part but it's a it's a point of concern for me even still but uh Eagles 13 penalties a lot of those holding and I could have pointed out four or five more times when Parsons was getting held, even when he was going against Lane Johnson. People who wanted to marginalize uh, Parsons' impact the previous week against the Chargers for going against Storm Nelson or whoever it was, a reserve lineman, could not make that argument this week because even going against Lane Johnson, he was just completely enforcing his will and too much for Johnson to handle at times. So much so, Johnson sought him out to uh, trade jerseys after the game. So that's pretty impressive there. Uh, let's see. The Cowboys' only turnover was the fumble in the end zone. That was on their second series. And uh, they ran 71 plays. The Eagles did end up with 53. So because of garbage time, they did eventually get to where they needed to be. 
But this was just all around a dominant performance from the Cowboys. Offensively, defensively, even special teams aside from the missed PAT. Uh, really, really strong for Dallas. I think they responded exactly as you would like. Exactly as you would like in this game, given the stage. And I think really, and this is what I wrote about today for Blog and the Boys, I think your three-headed monster you have in Trayvon Diggs, a second-year cornerback, uh, Michael Parsons and Osa, rookies, I think you have a three-headed monster your defense can be built around for the future because you have the ball hawk elite lockdown corner who, at 24 years old, should have several good years ahead of him. You have the freak of nature athletic hybrid linebacker in Parsons who can be a linebacker or defensive end for whatever you need. And you have a dominant center, or sorry, excuse me, defensive tackle in the center, that's where I was going, center of your defense who can blow up and collapse a pocket from within the heart. That is so important. You can affect, like, games are won and lost in the trenches. That's why as great as it is to have the lockdown corner, it really is arguably more important to have the defensive pressure up front. Just ask the Giants with their two Super Bowls with Eli Manning. The defensive line is what built those champions. You've got that because of what you've got in your two parts there for the future with Parsons and Osa. You've got that covered. And you've got enough guys that should still be around for a while longer, you know, Gregory and whatnot, that can make your pass rush crazy good. Your depth and rotation at your defensive line, especially once Neville Gallimore gets back, is fantastic. It all boils down to what you can do around those three because you've got a three-headed monster 24 is Trayvon Diggs age 23 is Osa's age 22 is Micah Parsons age all three of those guys I'm calling it now all three of those guys will be perennial pro bowlers multiple pro bowls for each of them I'm saying even Osa can get one or more phenomenal what parts they have to build around people look at Micah Parsons and for mostly good reason but they might look at him and say he is just an absolute monster. He's Godzilla. I'm here to tell you these three are actually part of a greater beast. They are King Ghidorah, straight up. But Derek, I hear you say, Godzilla killed King Ghidorah. Yeah, there they were mitigating circumstances. It was, it was Mothra and Godzilla and atomic godzilla with the nuke charge we're getting really niche here and getting into the the details all you need to know is straight up one-on-one -on -one Ghidorah, and basically any incarnation is stronger than godzilla and the three of them are a three-headed monster not just for the future of the cowboys defense for the right damn now the defense the two leading pressures on the defense Micah Parsons with 15 leads the team. Number two, Osa, fellow rookie, 10. They're good. They're good, and they cannot be denied. That is what I'm saying. So the Cowboys defense, once they get back to full strength, once you get D-Law back, once you get Keanu Neal back, once you get um, who's someone else that they're missing right now? They're, they're missing several. Oh, Neville Galmore, I said earlier. Once you get that back and they're at full strength, this is not just a middle-of-the-pack defense in the league. This is not a league-average defense. This could be a top-10 defense, potentially. They lead the NFL through three weeks in takeaways with eight. To give that context, they didn't log their eighth turnover of the year last year until week 11. Week three? Week 11. Tell me how you feel about this defense considering they've played the Bucks, the Chargers, and the Eagles. They good. They good. But that's my time for this video, guys. Let me know in the comments, how do you feel about the Cowboys moving forward? Because I'm feeling quite good right now. Like the video, leave a comment, let me know how you feel. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.